It's a pleasure for me to have my daughter Abby with me. She finished her year 12 last year and she's interning with us at the church this year. So she's got to do a whole lot of fun stuff, enjoying this apostolic adventure and being part of a local church and learning all the ins and outs of a local church. So, Luke, you're in trouble today. I'm going to, I think largely what Chris just preached was for you and the rest of us, but particularly you. And uh, the word I had for you while you were worshipping this morning was that God has his finger on your fader. So a fader is on the soundboard at the back. And when, go, when the sound guy wants something to be heard, he puts his finger on that fader and he turns it up. And when he does that, whatever he just turned up gets heard. And God says his finger is on your fader. All right. Let's get into some Bible because the Bible's good. Why don't you open with me to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read 14 verses. And then we're going to have a look at a few of those 14. I don't know how many yet. It says this, and I don't apologize for reading a whole 14 verses because God's word is powerful. More powerful than if I took 30 minutes or 40 minutes or 5 hours to say what I thought. I'd rather take a few minutes to read God's word because that's where the power is. So it says this, in the the first book, O Theophilus, don't you just want to have a kid called Theophilus? I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them, he ordered them, he ordered them. It wasn't advice, it was an order. What did he order them? A pizza. No, he he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. So my Bible, ordered is underlined. Wait is circled, underlined. For the promise of the Father, which he said, "You you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So that's a promise. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things... As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, underlined, (laughs) while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. So what I want to talk about this morning is living well in the gap between God's promise and God's provision. The reason I want to talk about that is because I think we spend most of our life there. I think the majority of our life is spent in the gap. God gives us a promise. God tells us this is your future. And then there's a process before we step into the promise, before we take hold of the provision, and before we launch into what God promised. We see that gap in these disciples right here. Jesus himself gave them a promise. You will receive power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will be my witnesses with power. And then for 10 days, there was no power. No power. The promise. How many of us, when we get a promise from God, we go, yes, there's a promise from God. I'm going to transition right into that right now. And we think, yes, that's going to start today. (laughs) In my ever-increasing experience as I age, (laughs) 
what I've found is nothing promised today ever starts today. <laughs> There's always a process of actually us embracing what God said and us walking with God in a particular way that can release and launch us into the promise. But there's also things we can do that can hinder that. I think we can, by learning to gap well, I think we can shorten some of the lengths of time in our gap processes. I know for me, some gaps in my life have been long. I'm a slow learner. I got got saved when I was 17 years old. I loved that Chris said, pray for the drug addicts. Why? Because I was that drug addict. I got pulled out of a gutter by a lady who had enough faith to pull me out and say, Jesus has got more for you. Why? Because an old nana of mine with short gray hair and a little blue rinse who's with Jesus now prayed for me by name at four o'clock every morning. Her face in a chair. Jesus, save that moron. (laughs) Pray for the drug addicts. But can I say this? Go lift them out of the gutters too. Show them Jesus. Be Jesus for them. Right. So at 17, I got saved. I walked into a church. It happened to be led by Tyrone's dad at the time. And we we started to hear about this team. And God spoke to me and he said, you're going to be on that team. I'm like, oh, awesome. I'll just go give Dudley my number. (laughs) Thinking it was going to be today. (laughs) 20 years. 20 years between God saying and that happening. 20 years. Could it have been 10? Maybe. If I was a quicker learner, if I handled my gap a little better. Some of you younger people, God's given you promises. You're saying, God, I want that promise. God, I want that promise. Good. Let's see what these guys did to walk into their promises. I love the way that this passage starts. In my first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Began to do and to teach. And then a couple of verses later, it says that Jesus left. How was it talking about what he began to do and teach? Like the inference is there's a continuation of what he's going to do and teach, but then he leaves. I've pondered that and I thought, wow, what is all that? So I started to dig around and what I found was that the, 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 the book of Acts has been credited to the author, Dr. Luke who also wrote the book of Luke. Now, back in their day, they didn't have iPhones and iPads. They couldn't write a whole Bible and put it on a tiny phone. They used to write letters on papyrus scrolls. And they had established that the, the most convenient length for a papyrus scroll to be able to be rolled up and carried around was about 35 feet. So when they wrote a letter, they would limit the the length of that letter to 35 feet so that they could roll the thing up and it was practical. So what we see in the the book of Luke and the book of Acts is one book that's written over two scrolls, Luke and Acts. And you know when you watch a TV series, you, you watch a whole episode and then you can't wait for the next episode and the first five minutes is reruns of the last episode? Don't you see that overlap at the end of Luke and the start of Acts? They started the series. <laughs> they showed the TV producers how to do this. The, the, in the, the last chapter and a bit of Luke overlaps with the beginning, the, the first chapter of the book of Acts. So what we see is these two scrolls, 35 feet long, but it's one book that tells one story in two parts. Part one is what we call Luke. And Acts, uh, Luke says that in the book of Luke, he covers what Jesus began to do and to teach. In scroll number two, what we call the book of Acts, he's going to address what Jesus continues to do and to teach, despite the fact that Jesus left right at the start. 
He then tells them how he's going to continue that. Through them. He says, I am, this is what I began to do and to teach, but I'm going to continue to do and to teach because it's better for you that I go because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And then guess what? You are going to continue doing and teaching what I began doing and teaching because the same power that was in me to do it is going to be in you and it's going to continue. And could I dare say that that 35-foot scroll of the book of Acts is still being unfurled? Because we are in it. We are still doing and teaching the things that Jesus began to do and to teach because that same power is in us. We live on the correct side of this this particular promise. I'm sure we've got a lot of other unfulfilled promises, but this promise was fulfilled. He promised the power. We live on the correct side of the outpouring of that power. We are the continuation of what Jesus started. Verses 4 and 5, he says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You would think that's a fairly clear instruction. Stay and wait. Two words. These disciples had walked with Jesus for three years. He says two words, stay and wait. He then goes on to tell them what they're waiting for and how to go about that. Why why was it so important that they stayed and waited? Because Jesus knew that if they were going to continue doing what he had begun to do and to teach... They needed the infilling of the same power he had to do it. And they didn't have it yet. So he said, don't go out and do it yet. You'll mess it up. Because you haven't got the power yet. So stay and wait. And then when you have the power, go. (laughs) Again, we live on the right side of this promise. We have the power. So stay and wait. And this word wait, we read that and we think waiting. Yeah, we're good at that. I'm going to sit down, put my feet up, grab the TV. I'm going to Netflix and wait. (laughs) What are you doing? I'm waiting. What for? Well, God gave me a promise. So what are you doing about that? I'm waiting. I'm on my 15th episode. (laughs) And good news, there's a series two (laughs) and three. I can wait as long as the Lord tarries. (laughs) But we've got the wrong interpretation of the word wait. It's not a passive sitting and doing nothing. You know, in Australia, we have these people that we call waiters. I don't know what you guys call them here. Americans have an even better word for them, which I'll get to in a minute. But could you imagine walking into a restaurant, sitting down, and somebody came over and said, Hello, great to have you here this evening, Dave. I hope you've got your camera representing the World Loves Melbourne. <laughs> and take a blog out. <laughs> I'm going to be your waiter this evening. So I'm going to be sitting at the back over there watching Netflix. If you need anything, uh, just try and get my attention, and I'll come and do what I can. And then I walk off, go sit at the back, put my feet up, watch Netflix, and Dave's at the front going, this guy's my waiter. He looks at me, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm waiting. (laughs) That is not how to wait for the promises of God. See, the other word that the Americans love to use is they'll come over and say, hello, my name's Paul, and I'm going to be your server. Your server, your waiter, your server, same thing. And serving is a better interpretation of this word wait. We are not to passively wait and do nothing in the hope that God's promises will come into effect. We are to give ourselves and our lives to the service of the one who gave the promise. 
And when we get active in serving the one who gave the promise, it activates the power behind the promise because now we're doing things that we can't do without the power. How many of us here can heal the sick? None. How many of us can have the Holy Spirit in us heal the sick through us? Every single one of us. How do we do that? Well, if we never try, we don't need the power. We don't need the power to heal the sick if we're never, ever going to pray for a sick person. We don't need that power until we do it. Serving. When we get serving, it activates the power of the promise. So waiting, get active, serving. Verses 6 and 7. When they came together, they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Don't you love how he gives them instructions? He says, okay, guys, this is what I want you to do. Stay. Wait. And their response, what are you going to do? Hang on, I just told you what I want you to do. Stay and wait. But what are you going to do? Are you going to restore the kingdom? Can you just stay and just wait and let me worry about what I'm going to do? (laughs) I just love it. Jesus doesn't say, no, no, the kingdom's not going to be. He doesn't clarify anything. He just says, why are you worried about what I'm going to do when I'm talking to you about what you need to do? (laughs) He will establish his kingdom, but their role after the staying and waiting was to go into all the world and be witnesses and continue all all that Jesus had begun to do and to teach. Nowhere in that is it influenced by what he's doing now. But that became their focus. He says, take your focus off what I'm doing and let's keep talking about what you're doing. Verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So he gives them vision, commission, He gives them a promise of explosive, dynamite power. And we often we think that word that power is all about signs and wonders and miracles. But actually, it involves signs and wonders and miracles and healings and all those radical things. But that word is used in the book of Acts, in places like Acts 4:33, Acts 6, 8, Acts 6, 10, that same word that talks about dynamic power is a power for speaking boldly about Jesus. Which may or may not involve signs, wonders, miracles and healings. He's not going to do them if that's not what's needed. (laughs) But what is needed is for us to speak boldly about Jesus. And he says, he clarifies, I will give you power and you will be my witnesses. So the purpose of the power is witnessing. We are, as people who know the person of Jesus, he gives us the power to speak about Jesus to people who don't know Jesus. Why does the, I get asked all the time, why is the modern church not moving in the significant power of the, of the Holy Spirit like the early church did? Maybe it's because we don't talk about Jesus as much as they did. <laughs> Maybe just linking the thoughts together. If we'll activate the need of the power by saying, God, I am going to be a witness. And to be a witness, I need your power. To have your power, I need to be in your presence. Ooh. All right. Moving on, moving on. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I love how he brings a context to their calling. Yeah, if, we put a, if we ask for a show of hands in any modern church these days, said, who would like to move in signs and wonders and miracles and healing and preach Jesus? Every hand's going to go up. But we all think we're going to do that on the church stage in a Sunday meeting. Well, the calling and the context was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's not where our churches are. <laughs> We've we got to take this calling outside of our context, outside of our churches, and, and be willing to preach Jesus and, and do our, our ministry, which is his ministry, through us, really, if we're honest about it, of signs and wonders and miracles and healings outside the walls of our churches. 
That's where they're needed and that's where they happen easily. I love the way he says, and just throws in Judea and Samaria. And, and why are they thrown in there? Actually, the guys he was speaking to were Jewish. And they didn't really like Samarians. So Jesus was making it very clear that some of the people you need to go preach to and some of the people that need my presence and some of the people that need my power aren't the kind of people you like very much. But are you going to let your love for me supersede your dislike of them? Because when you do, I'm going to reach them through you. And when I was lying in a gutter, I don't know how many Christians walked past me. I got no idea. I was only partially conscious at best. But one Christian stopped, lifted my head up, and started to tell me that Jesus loved me. One believer made a difference in my life. One believer. Who here this morning is one believer? You can be that same difference to someone just by lifting their head up and showing them Jesus loves them. Yeah, it's easy for us to sit in our churches and call the lost in. God, we pray for the lost. Reach the lost. Bring them in, Lord. What we're saying is, Jesus, you told us to go get the lost, but we'd rather you did that. Help us have a lovely meeting. And you do our job of bringing the lost in. He actually didn't say, go into all your churches and pray for the lost to come and I will bring them to you. He said, go into the world and make disciples. Yeah, even this, we get so easily messed up. We think make disciples means bring people to church. I am discipling people in my city right now who aren't even believers. They're not in my church. They're not believers. They are my friends. (laughs) But we sit and we talk and the friendship opens up conversations and they ask for perspective and they ask for, I've got a business background and these two guys I'm discipling are businessmen. So they'll ask me business questions. I get to give them business answers. I mean, you can probably tell by my mild conservatism, I used to be an accountant. (laughs) So I get to give them answers. Is that not active discipling? I bring Jesus into every conversation possible, but without getting weird, without getting spiritual, and without trying to... I'm actually trying to make it hard for these guys to come to my church. I want them to know me and Jesus better before they come in and meet some of these messed up people. (laughs) Just being real. (laughs) But the harder I'm making it for them to come to my church, the more intrigued they are, the more keen they are. One of these guys is like, I'm coming to your church. I'm like, no, no, no. (laughs) Now, there'll come a time where I'm like, you must come in. Come now. Today's your day. But I'm discipling them outside of the church. Why? Because Jesus told me to go into the world. And make disciples. He didn't say go into the world, find people, bring them into the church and then make them disciples. Go and disciple them. John 17, 18, Jesus said, As you sent me into the world, I now send them. Matthew 28, 18, go into the world and make disciples. Jesus' authorization is to go do it. And he backs it when we do. You know, we can look at our situation and say, well, I'm going to go to school today. I'm going to go to university today. I'm going to go to work today. Or we can look at it and go, Jesus is sending me to those places today. And I'm going to go there and disciple people. And I'm going to make a difference. And the kingdom is going to expand because I'm going to forcefully expand it in the places that he sent me to. Verse 9. And when he said all these things, I love the way the Bible's so honest and just gives us the real deal. As they were looking on, he was lifting, he was lifted up and a cloud took them out of their sight. The gap begins. 
Verse 10, 11. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Now we know that's how the Bible describes angels. So two angels said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the way, same way you saw him go. Let's just imagine for a moment we're there. We are disciples. We knew nothing. We were fishermen. And Jesus said, come walk with me. We walk with him. Three years he invests in us. And then he says, oh, it's better for you guys now that I go. Wait. No, it's not. Outside of you, we don't know anything. We, we can do this because you're here. We don't want you to go anywhere. And then he says, no, no, it's better that I go. So I'm going. And then they stand there and they watch him go. The cloud covers disappeared. They're all standing there going. Oh, oh, Jesus. I'm a bit nervous now. Uh, my mentor's gone. I don't think I can do this anymore. And then the next guy looks up. Do you think he's coming back? <laughs> he just told you he's not. He told you what to do when he goes. He told you he was going and what to do when he went. And then they stand there like humans, <laughs> gazing into heaven. And it took an angelic visitation to come along to them and go, why are you standing here gazing into heaven? <laughs> yeah, I think some of us need an angelic visitation. <laughs> we go from conference to conference, from outpouring presence this to presence that, and we stand there going, oh, Jesus, I don't know if I could do this without you. And he says, no, it's better for you that I went because when it was me, it was the one me and 12 of you. But now when I go, it's going to be one Holy Spirit and all of you. Yeah. That's better equation. Yeah. <laughs> but there they were, gazing in heaven. Well, what do we do now? He told you what to do now. <laughs> Stay and wait and then go and witness. Now, we're on the other side of the staying and waiting, so we're living in the season that should be going and witnessing, yeah. going and making disciples. Yeah. Yet, how much of our time is spent stargazing? Is Jesus coming back? Yes, he is, but he told us we don't know when. Right. <laughs> so until he does, what should we do? Go and witness. <laughs> Go and take his power and put it to use. You know, nowhere in the scriptures does it say, hey, you should be holy rollers and make sure you do like signs and wonders conventions so you can perform your party tricks for your Christian friends. Wow. <laughs> it says, go into the world and take my power there where it's needed. Don't just try and show me off to the saved. They already know me. You want to move in signs and wonders, miracles and healings? Go where the desperate people are. The ones who don't know him yet. Let's get our hands on some of them and show Jesus. Be Jesus. Continue doing and teaching what he began doing and teaching. All right, so finally, after their angelic visitation, these guys step into obedience. In verse 12, it says... They returned to Jerusalem, finally obedience. Now Luke 24, 52, which is the overlapping chapter, says they did it with great joy. So might I suggest that we should respond with obedience and with great joy and get involved in what Jesus is doing. Verse 13 says they entered, they went up to the upper room. I love this. It says... Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. I think sometimes we gloss over lists like that and go, I didn't, did I really need to know who was there? But what we need to understand is Luke 
Acts, same author. Authors have a style. In Luke, he always mentions those brothers in pairs of brothers. Always. Every mention. Simon and Andrew, James and John. Now he throws it all up and says, Peter, John, James and Andrew. Why? Did he, was he having a bad day and forgot the sequence? No, he was showing us that in the Holy Spirit is a new order that is even going to supersede your established family lines. What Jesus is going to do in us and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit is going to upset our orders and our patterns. It's going to mess up our, some of our commitments. It's going to mess up some of our loyalties. He's going to mix things up and we're going to go and we're going to move in power. Verse 14 All of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. Again, Luke 24, 53 says that they they must have had this pattern where they were going between the upper room for prayer and the temple for praise. So this is how they gapped well. They obeyed, they had great joy, and they devoted themselves to prayer and to praise. They prayed and they praised their way into the provision for the promise of God. I think we're called to do exactly the same thing. Commit ourselves to prayer. Commit ourselves to the gathering together. One place, one accord. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not give up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I don't know about where you live, but I live in a town of 36,000 people. And the biggest church in our town is the church of people who believe in Jesus but go nowhere and do nothing. They've given up the meeting together. What does that tell me? They're never going to step into their purposes, their promises, their plan of God for their lives because they've stepped out of his pattern and process. How do we close the gap? We become people of prayer. People of praise, we gather together. And when we gather together, we come expectant and we come with faith. Because Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let's get well. Close those distances and get into the purposes and plans of God for our lives. And just stand, let's pray. And when the fire, when the, when the presence of God fell on them, there was, it was like tongues of fire and like a raging wind. And there was all this, it, it was mayhem. I don't think that happened in a, in a 20 minute time slot so they could have tea. Now, I'm not here to mess up our time frames. I'm just saying, are we still expectant? When we come together and we, are we when somebody prays, are we like on the edge of our life? Saying, God, could this be? Could this be? Will there be a, a, a tongue of fire on my head this morning? So, Jesus, we thank you that it is better for us that you left. And we love you. But we want that Holy Spirit upon us this morning. So, God, we ask right now that your power would be poured upon us to help us gap well, that your presence would be on us, that your peace would rule in our hearts and our minds. We wouldn't get caught up in the pressures and the busyness and the anxieties that are killing our friends, that you would give us such a sense of your presence, your peace, and your incredible power. God, that you would anoint us to be witnesses that you would gift us to go make disciples, that you would empower us to be the ones who will bring the life of Jesus to a person who knows nothing of Jesus. May we be the ones who lift some heads out of gutters. May we be the ones who will not only just pray for some drug addicts, but will go get those drug addicts and we will disciple them and teach them there is a better way to live. And may we show them the power of God. May we see incredible deliverance and healing and signs and wonders and miracles happening as we dare to step into a lifestyle that actually requires those things. Help us, God. Anoint us, God. Give us your presence and your power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.